For 22 years, Ozzie Nelson wrote, produced, and directed a popular radio and television series, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. It was the story of a family, his own. Harriet, a former singer, dancer, and actress, and his wife since 1935, and their two sons, David and Ricky, who literally grew up before our eyes on the television screen. The series captured and held the middle ground of American family life, a kind of Mr. and Mrs. Average family that few knew and everyone wanted. When the series ended in 1966, Ozzie Nelson took time out to play volleyball and write his autobiography, titled simply Ozzie. But he couldn't stay his writing hand. In the fall of 1973, he introduced a new series, Ozzie's Girls, with the same Ozzie and Harriet, but without his two sons, now grown and pursuing their own careers. Ozzie, over the more than 20 years that you did the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, when it was so popular, were you ever acutely conscious of the pattern that you were setting for American family life? Did it ever occur to you that it was more than entertainment, that you were a kind of model? Uh, no, it, it uh, really didn't, and we never set out to do that. I know you didn't set out to do it. No, uh, and uh, actually it just sort of uh, eased, uh, it sort of eased into that area, because when we started the show, uh, Actually, it was a band leader and his vocalist wife mm -hmm. and what they were doing at home because uh, we had found we were touring in vaudeville with the band. It seemed that uh, many more people seemed to be interested in our home life and uh, at that uh, time David mm -hmm. was born and Ricky, mm -hmm. Ricky wasn't. Mm -hmm. So when we started this, uh, it just sort of eased into the, the family department. Well, you must have been aware over the years as you met hundreds if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of fans. Didn't they say to you, we wish we had a family <coughs> like that? Well, uh, yes, uh, not so much the parents, but we would get a lot of letters mm -hmm. from young people uh, who perhaps looked at our life on the on television screen, mm -hmm. which also was not exactly a true uh, pattern of what anybody's life would be, mm -hmm. because uh, we had to come up with 39 or 40 amusing things and maybe two amusing things happened to anyone in, in, you know, in a period of six months. And uh, we got letters from lots of uh, unhappy teenagers who said if they came out here, would we adopt them and so forth. And Did you find yourself giving counsel and advice to those who wrote to you? Well, we tried to avoid it. I should we, think so. It would be yes. a terrible burden to take on, and quite apart from doing a television series. Uh, yes, and uh, also I think there's a great danger of those of us who are in the entertainment business, and uh, all of a sudden we're in the public eye, and we get to feel that we're uh, pundits on mm -hmm. uh, any question anybody might ask. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I'm sure that uh, uh, Marcus Welby must get a lot of questions on medical situations and somebody mm -hmm. portrays a lawyer and he gets a lot of questions asked mm -hmm. of him on, on the uh, legal matters. And uh, we really tried to avoid that, although many, many of the letters that we did receive were nice enough to say that we had brought up our boys to be quite normal boys, mm -hmm. uh, although they were brought up in, in the uh, public uh, limelight. Mm -hmm. Over the years, as the characters became you, I, I hesitate to speak of you as characters, but as people, yes, became yeah. to be so well established in the minds of a television audience, and you were writing, or was that you were yes. the head writer on this show, did you find your own personal life began to be, in a sense, a reflection of the show at all? Uh, yes, uh, actually sometimes it was a little bit difficult for us to uh, uh, know where the separation came mm -hmm. between our own lives and our lives at home. Uh, and, uh, of course, we also had a great deal of problem uh, not indulging in too much uh, togetherness, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, taking each other for granted because it's a tough thing when you're with somebody uh, in the daytime and the evening, too. I remember one time we, I came home and Harriet said to me, do you realize that we're on the set that you're nice to everybody except me? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that the... Uh, 
that the boys felt a little the same thing too. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, I'm afraid, I think that we leaned over backwards to try to give them as much freedom and, and as much liberty uh, so they wouldn't be under the dominance of their parents uh, you know, mm -hmm. during the rest of their lives. Because they were under the dominance of their parent during the time they were on their show because you were the director of the show. Yes, they had in, to be, in that they? essence. Yeah. And that's a very difficult thing because as I mentioned in, in the, mm -hmm. the book, mm -hmm. there's really no way, particularly when Dave and Rick got married, there's no way of directing your son and your daughter-in-law without uh, being a little bit of, a, of an irritating force. Sure. Uh, because y you rarely hear anybody say that a director is a, a, a nice guy. They'll say, well, he's a so-and-so, but he's a good director. Mm -hmm. Because you're the guy who is telling people to do something that maybe doesn't, con doesn't fit in with exactly mm -hmm. their idea of how it should be done. Because a tough part of being a director anyway is that you have to look at the overall picture where each actor looks at the script from his own particular viewpoint. And since you're using your real life son and his real life, uh, real life wife, yes, then you've got that additional difficulty of directing them on how to behave toward each other, which <coughs> I should think would that, be a that, real complication. Uh, you bet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a. a it was a, a more of a difficult situation for us than if we had been playing characters. I know every once in a while uh, we would have a dream sequence or something where we'd be able to put on a costume or a beard and it was so much easier to act under those circumstances yeah. because the hardest acting in the world is uh, portraying yourself. Many actors, as a matter of fact, go into acting because of the mask, so to speak. They can hide yes. their real selves. Yes. You expose your real selves. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, uh, Maya, of course, it was a reasonable character, reasonable extension, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, we were not fully conscious of this uh, specifically, but uh, we felt it as sort of a part of a burden that we were carrying. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the scripts were concerned, we had to be careful, whereas the scripts had to be a reasonable exaggeration, nevertheless they always did portray in a general form mm -hmm. uh, our thinking on certain things. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, several people uh, in a tour that I, I, I recently made uh, promoting not only the mm -hmm. book but our new show, Ozzy's mm -hmm. Girls, they said, are you going to change your standards from the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. And I said, well, I couldn't very well do that because it would be dishonest. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Maud, uh, they treat, he was an alcoholic in one of the scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, had an abortion in one of the scenes. Well, uh, this would be totally dishonest for us to portray this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, I uh, portray a, a person who is a little over the edge, who is a, uh, an ice cream freak, <laughs> <laughs> which I am to a certain degree. <laughs> But we have taken, I think, we've tried to take the general characteristics that are attributable mm -hmm. usually to husbands and extended yeah. them as far as I was concerned and as far as wives were concerned and extended them yeah. to Harriet's character. One criticism that's been uh, uh, spoken of the show, and it's a mild criticism it seems to me, is that, <clears throat> that the show was a more accurate picture of New Jersey in the 20s than yeah. Los Angeles in the 50s. Now, of course, you grew up in New Jersey. Yes, so, yes. And it would, I suppose, be a... Uh, since you were the writer, it was bound to be reflective of your own life, uh, 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 your own past, as well as your present, I should Yes, say. I, I think so. And I think that it's, uh, it's very difficult for anybody who's writing to uh, keep his own thoughts and keep a great deal of himself out of his writings. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I not only use the pattern of my relationship to David and Ricky, but also uh, I was uh, my uh, have a, I have a brother who's very much younger than I am, but I also have a brother who's a year and a half older. Yeah. And uh, I patterned a lot of the thoughts and a lot of the uh, happenings, actually, from things that did happen to my brother and me mm -hmm. uh, back in New Jersey. Now you said in your book it was a very happy childhood. You speak yes, very yes. fondly of your father and said you tried, to pattern my, you tried to pattern your life after your father's life. That's right, yes. What uh, was there about your father that made him such a hero to you? Uh, well, he was a uh, very kindly and very understanding man. And uh, this sounds like a... Uh, far departure, but uh, uh, he had some of the same uh, fine traits that uh, Harriet has. Mm -hmm. And that is, there are very few people, I think, who have two standards where their own standard of conduct is higher than the standard of conduct they demand of others. Mm -hmm. 
and I think this was something that my father had. He was very tolerant of the conduct of others, but he was very circumspect as far as his own conduct mm -hmm. is concerned. And uh, Harriet's pattern of life has been pretty much the same, that uh, she is very lenient as far as other, judging other people, uh, but as far as her own conduct is concerned, she is very, very severe, very, about, very harsh about her own mm -hmm. conduct. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as I say, I have tried to think back uh, I really didn't appreciate my father because he died uh, at that time, because he died w on my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And I think that young men have a tendency not to forgive their mm -hmm. parents until they get to be a little bit older and realize uh, what the problems are that uh, confront parents. I would judge that uh, scouting was an in, uh, a major influence in your life as well. You were an Eagle <coughs> Scout at yes. 13. Now, that, that, that set a, an all-time record. Well, at that time, I don't uh, think they ever kept the ages, but I didn't know any but kids. But you weren't eligible were to be a scout until you were 12. 12 so was, to yes. become an Eagle Scout, I was a scout myself, so I know that to become an Eagle Scout in one year was, is most remarkable. You must have gone into it with enthusiasm, energy, and everything else. Well, yeah, as, as I say, I had a lot of help from my brother, who was a year mm -hmm. and a half older than I was, and so while he was taking all the tests, uh, I was sort of taking right. them along with him, mm -hmm. so most of the time I just waited for the for the time to expire when I could uh, move mm -hmm. to another test. And also, scouting was a very, very big thing in those days, right. particularly in small towns. Mm -hmm. And the town I was brought up in, Ridgefield Park, is the kind of town, as I say, that seems no longer to exist. Uh, it, it had all of the community spirit and so forth. And, and also, when I was a, a radio just came in when I was in high school, mm -hmm. and uh, talking pictures came in a little bit later, so, and television, of course, wasn't there, so that the, uh, uh, scouting was a thing that most kids went into. Mm -hmm. uh, they had I don't know how many Boy Scout troops in this little town and everybody just waited till he was big enough and old mm -hmm. enough to be a Boy Scout mm -hmm. and then we went away to scout camp and took the various tests that there. That took you to Europe, your uh, first... Yes, I went to Europe w with the first Boy Scout Jamboree mm -hmm. which was a, a very fortunate thing and I, I was very happy that I uh, wrote a diary on the uh, mm -hmm. on the tour mm -hmm. <laughs> because it uh, enabled me to uh, remember a lot of things and also my brother went on the tour too he was an Eagle Scout and he kept a diary so uh, that gave me a lot of material for the for the book during that particular yes. period athletics I judge was also a major influence upon your life you were in athletics at a very early age and very active and in a wide variety of athletics football and uh, yes. swimming. Well, well, there once again, uh, in the small town I was brought up in, it was uh, most of the boys there were uh, athletically minded, mm -hmm. and uh, my father was a very good athlete. So our uh, our little room, the bedroom that my brother and I uh, lived together in, was sort of like a miniature gymnasium, mm -hmm. and we used to have the uh, the uh, weekly boxing bouts, and uh, my father used to box with us and. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think most of the kids in that particular town were very much uh, athletically oriented. Were you a large boy? No, no, I was rather small. <laughs> I see. So it did, I suppose, limit the, 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 the part you played in athletics. Uh, yes, yes, it did. I, mm -hmm. I was uh, fortunately, however, on our little high school team, which turned out to be in my last two years in school, we were undefeated. Mm -hmm. we, we lost one game, we, we were undefeated my senior mm -hmm. year, and we had a lot of other bigger boys, and so uh, uh, I. I played quarterback in those days. The quarterback's function was a little different. It was mostly handing off yeah. and catching punts and things of that sort. And uh, so as long as I was surrounded by a lot of other big boys to run interference, why the small stature didn't seem to bother too much. But you did very well at Rutgers when you went there playing varsity football. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I uh, went down to Rutgers uh, to, I, I think, uh, I really don't think I would have gone to college if it hadn't been for, for football. Really? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, I, well, it's, it seems strange, but uh, my, I just experienced my 50th uh, uh, anniversary of my graduation from high school. I don't know where the time has gone. <laughs> but in that period of time, like 50 years ago, there really weren't as many kids going to college mm -hmm. as there are nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, I say I wouldn't have gone. Probably, uh, probably that's not quite true. Uh, let's say that that was one of the uh, uh, impelling forces mm -hmm. that I had in the background of my Your coach in, at, at Rutgers, I gather, was a great influence upon you as well. Yes, the Forrester Sanders. referred to him as a kind of a second father. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was, he was really an, an outstanding man. He mm -hmm. was of the old school. He was a rough and ready guy and mm -hmm. a very rugged man. But uh, uh, Sandy was a, it was, uh, I say, of the old blood and thunder uh -huh. school. And uh, he was of the... He was a locker room orator, mm -hmm. and 
and uh, as, as I said in the one... You, you one coached of for a couple of years after yes. you got out of Rutgers. Were you a locker room order also? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I was. Did you pattern yourself uh, after uh, him? Yes, I'm afraid uh, to a certain degree. And uh, that was during the time of uh, when Newt Rockney was coaching at mm -hmm. Notre Dame. And that was the thing. You gave this fiery oratory in the... And no matter what they say nowadays, uh, they still come on and do a, a pretty good job yeah. of talking, uh -huh. even in the pro ranks, although they're reluctant to admit it. Uh -huh. You uh, uh, have, I guess, been in show business almost all of your life. Your parents were amateur entertainers, were they not? Yes. And uh, you grew up, more or less, in a musical world. Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I was looking through an old book the other day. I saw a photograph, and it said a typical a musical evening with a family uh, around uh, mm -hmm. 1920 or ni in 1915, mm -hmm. somewhere thereabouts. And that was typical of our family. Almost everybody played some sort of an instrument and sang. What and was yours? You, uh, well, I studied the violin for a very short time. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, studied it for a while, and I thought I was doing very well. And then all of a sudden, I learned that there was more than one position, and that defeated me. <laughs> And along about that time, the ukulele became very popular. So uh, I got a ukulele, and then I tuned that up like a banjo, and then saxophones became popular, so I started playing saxophone. And mm -hmm. Contrary to, to general belief, people who are not familiar with music, if you can play one instrument, usually you can play almost any instrument with a little, uh, little trying. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the kids, uh, uh, that uh, the musicians, uh, that I went with could play various uh, instruments. That may encourage an awful lot of kids to play the ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, nowadays the, the, it's the guitar. Everybody plays yes. the guitar, uh -huh. and it's. Uh, and you started off with with small musical uh, groups when you were what in high school, I suppose. And yes, uh, our our band uh, was a two piece orchestra, if you can call a two piece uh, <laughs> group a band. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was another boy who played really excellent piano, and I played banjo, and then I also. Uh, brought along my violin when I tuned the E string to E flat so I could slide up and down yeah. it sort of like a musical saw and uh, because my brother occasionally played piano with us too and he could only play in E flat and B flat mm -hmm. so we had to tune that down. We, we made all sorts of <laughs> all sorts of adjustments. <laughs> Ozzie, I suppose the first time I became conscious of Ozzie Nelson's orchestra was when you began to play at the Glen, Glen Allen Casino yeah. and broadcast on radio. Yes. Now the th thing I did not know was that you were still in law school and yes. Glen Allen Casino was one of the biggest places from which to play, I guess, in the whole yes. country. Yes. Well, uh, Glen Allen Casino, uh, our band was the first band to play there. Mm. It started us, and I guess we started Glen Allen Casino, because after us there was a whole series of named yeah. bands. But uh, we started at Glen Island, and uh, it sort of overlapped. I had to take a night off from Glen Allen Casino to graduate from law school. The three mm. things sort of converged. I was coaching football at Lincoln High School, and I had the dance band that was doing very well. And then I was in law school, and I really uh, didn't know which way to turn. And I figured that I would stay with the, with the dance band until I'd accumulated enough money to, uh, to uh, study law mm -hmm. and open up an office. But uh, I think it's a little late didn't now. Didn't work out, did it? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think it's been of great value during the years mm -hmm. because uh, it, uh, sitting around with a group of people, you know, I will f lay a couple of res ipsa loquiturs on them, so they don't realize how much I've forgotten. Yeah. And it's amazing uh, how many times I've been sitting in a group, and uh, the, the, what little I remember has come in handy. I also recall in those days you had a vocalist named Harriet Hilliard, yes, right. with whom you sang boy-girl yeah. duets. Now, yes, whatever happened yes. to her? Yes. <laughs> 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 well, she became Harriet Nelson, yes. and uh, yeah. right, you bet. Well, the reason I start, the reason I did that, the reason. Uh, uh, I started to have a vocalist with the band was because Rudy Valley, if you, if you recall, was Great a tremendous, yeah, he was a tremendous name in those days. Mm -hmm. It's hard for people nowadays to realize what a tremendous name Rudy was. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you recall, the girls loved him and the guys hated That's him. That's right. And uh, so uh, I didn't like that idea very much. And I thought maybe rather than to sing the songs to the girls that the guys mm -hmm. brought to the dance, if I could have a, an attractive girl on the bandstand and sing songs to her, musical comedy fashion, it might work out, and mm -hmm. so... Uh, it worked out. It, it, it worked out, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You went for, well, uh, in, that, in those days, 
bands like yours traveled constantly, <coughs> I suppose, and there were dance halls everywhere. Yes, uh, yes. Well, it, they, there was sort of a distinction between ballrooms and dance halls, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in other words, a ballroom was sort of a little more high class. A yes, dance I hall see. was sort of like Roseland and those yes. uh, a dime a dance. Yeah. But most every uh, community, uh, usually it was outside the city. Mm -hmm. For instance, it would be. Uh, Oh, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, Reading, Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania. They would have these huge ballrooms where the, 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 the young kids were college type kids and, and uh, working class kids of a very, uh, they, were, they were very orderly places. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, the dance halls were more, as we used to call them in those days, the Sharpies. But mm -hmm. these, were, uh, these were very nice places to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the nice part about it, there weren't enough name bands to go around in those days. There Not were more enough. places to mm -hmm. play than there were name bands to fill them. Mm -hmm. So as a result, uh, when you decide to go out on a summer tour, you could pretty much say, I would like to play here, 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 and here. And if you were fortunate enough to have the status of a name band, you could pretty much name mm -hmm. your spots. Do you suppose they'll ever come back? No, I really don't. It's a, it's a part of our past. Uh, yes, I, I really think so. I know when we had our dance band, uh, we used to see a clipping in the, in the paper every year. There was a notification that the Dancing Masters Association of America had met, convened, and decided that the waltz was coming back. <laughs> but the waltz never came back. Yeah. And, but the waltz was always with us. Now, I do think, for instance, uh, uh, the... the, the uh, uh, for instance, Doc Severinsen's band, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, or uh, the pr uh, present, uh, uh, several of the big organized bands now are playing fabulous big band music, I think, mm -hmm. just fantastic. But you couldn't take an organization on the road, you just couldn't afford to take an organization mm -hmm. on the road. Do you ever hanker to go back to music? Uh, not, a, not a great deal. Uh, I, I, I must say that uh, every once in a while I will listen to uh, some music and uh, say to Harriet, I, I kind of miss the connection with it. Mm -hmm. Of course, when Ricky was very young, when he was in his teens, uh, I more or less got brainwashed as far as rock music was concerned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I, uh, Are you thoroughly brainwashed it? now about rock music? Yes, if it's good. Mm -hmm. If it's good, I mm -hmm. like any kind of music. I like mm -hmm. anything from Dixieland to uh, uh, and any type of music at all, mm -hmm. as long as it's well played. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes those of us in my generation have a tendency to take the best of the music of my vintage and compare it to the worst of today's music, which yeah. is not fair. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of bad music played then, there's a lot of bad music played now, but there's also a lot of absolutely fabulous music played now. I don't know where this great musicianship is coming from, mm -hmm. but I know uh, uh, on New Year's Eve, Harriet and I spent our usual exciting New Year's w sitting back and watching television, you know, because I don't, you nobody, too. yeah, we do. I don't think anybody, you know, you, you, you can't win on yeah. New Year's Eve. If you go out, you wish you'd stayed home and vice yeah. versa. And I know, uh, uh, I don't even know the name of the group, but uh, there was Guy Lombardo playing on one of the stations, mm -hmm. and on the other station, there was a fantastic rock group playing mm -hmm with just fabulous musicianship. Mm -hmm. And it was really thrilling to hear. So I, I and I enjoy, still enjoy Lawrence Welk uh, when he's playing certain things, <laughs> uh, not all of it. But uh, uh, I, I enjoy any kind of music that is, that is well played. How do you feel about the trends with today's young people? You have some of your own, of course, and they have some of their own now. Yes. Uh, they, their view toward anti-establishment, uh, their uh, kind of anti-intellectual, pro-sensory experience. How do you feel about those things? Uh, well, I think it all levels off, and I think, uh, for instance, the so-called hippie syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, I think if it hadn't been picked up by the, uh, the, the, the press and by newspapers and magazines and, and uh, television, I think it would have died its natural mm -hmm. death. And I think that uh, they discovered, like every generation discovers, that uh, if there are five people and you've got food for five people, if ten sit down at the table, somebody's got to bring in some yeah. food, or five don't eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, however, that the hippie syndrome, for as an example of something from, mm -hmm. from the young people, that the hippie syndrome did us all a lot of good because I think that many of us were so oriented toward a uh, business type of success that we began to realize that maybe there is more to life than just this striving mm -hmm. and maybe we should enjoy some of the things that we have. And I think that that was an extreme and I think the same as, uh, the, same as the, 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 uh, the destruction that took place on the mm -hmm. campus I think reflected the thinking of a very few people. But I think sometimes even those things work out to the ultimate good 
and I do think that uh, young people are aiming toward honesty and integrity. The only thing I resent is when they claim that they invented it because uh, uh, you know I think integrity has been around for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. It's just that unfortunately in many high places we don't find it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I think it's all leveling. I think we can learn a lot from young people and I think they can learn a lot from us. And uh, one of the things when we stopped doing our show w that Harriet and I missed tremendously was the rapport that we developed with young people mm -hmm. because of doing. You really our thought show. you had that rapport with them. I, I, I rather, yeah. uh, of course, I, I, I don't think that. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. I, I think the person in my age group who has long hair and tries to act like a young person, uh, this, to my mind, uh, you know, is something that uh, I, I can't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can have rapport, and still you can be an older person, and that person can be a younger person. I mean, rapport in the best possible way. You're not a pal. You are an older person. Yeah. But that person respects your rights to think the way you want, and you respect your right, his right to think as he wants, as long as neither one uh, uh, interferes with the other person's right to do the mm -hmm. same thing. You worked very, very hard as producer, director, and head writer on the Adventures of Eyes and Harriet for many years, and then you took time off. Yes. And now you're back working again. Do you feel a compulsion to work? Do you, are you happy only when you're working? Uh, I think probably that's so. Not only when I'm working, probably, but I, I'm happy only when I'm busy. I like to be doing things. I say Weren't this, you busy playing volleyball? <laughs> yes, yes, I was. <laughs> and I say this, and yet uh, I am a voracious reader. And it's gotten to a point, however, now, uh, I always get a lot of books at Christmas and on my birthday. And now, however, the only difference when we're doing the show is when I start reading, uh, I feel very guilty. Uh, and I have to read very late at night, sort of surreptitiously, when nobody's <laughs> watching me. And, uh, but yes, I suppose there's a certain compulsion to be doing things, I guess, mm -hmm. to be a part of things. I, I, I hate to reach this point where you just sit in the sand and the whole world goes by. Uh, I think that's good uh, to go to a place like we have, fortunately, mm -hmm. in Laguna Beach, where you can recharge your batteries. But as a lifestyle, uh, I'm not quite ready yet to, uh, to step away from the mainstream. Ozzy, in 30 seconds, a question. Yes. Why do you think your show was so successful? Uh, well, I, I like to think that it was successful because uh, people were able to relate to what we were doing. And uh, going back to a thing, we have always made a sincere effort to keep our show honest. For instance, when the boys were small boys, uh, we never had uh, their dog killed by an automobile or things that, that would embarrass them with their, with, we try to keep it within the framework of what a normal family, I think, should do. And uh, I, I would like to think that the re people's ability to relate to our show and uh, integrity or honesty, which we strive for. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.